Beautiful. Now I'll get started. I'm going to get started because I usually do some introductory stuff anyways. And for a lot of you who are already, already here, I apologize because I do go through some of the same stuff at the beginning uh, every time. But, you know, we like to do these regular webinars um, and, and touch on applications on, on why we do certain measurements and then on technologies that we technologies that we feel excel at doing some of these measurements. And so what we're going to talk about today is going to primarily be about the measurement of dew points. Um, and we're going to talk about both uh, hydrocarbon and water dew points. And predominantly, this is a concern in, uh, in natural gas applications. And, and we're going to talk about this and specifically I'm going to talk a lot about the application, about dew point, about why we hit dew point problems, and then focus specifically on the Z-gas analyzers because they're really the only analyzer right now out there that actually does both water and hydrocarbon dew point simultaneously by the chilled mirror method. There's analyzers that will say they do hydrocarbon dew point by chilled mirror, um, and there's analyzers that'll say they do water and hydrocarbon, but one part of it's chilled mirror and one part of it is another technology. And so um, I, I like to talk, and, and ZGAS has a very unique, from a, and from a spectroscopic or spectroscopist perspective, they have a very gratifying way of doing it because they implement kind of a spectroscopy solution into that chilled mirror solution. So yeah, so we're going to talk about kind of who is inside analytical, what's dew point, and why do we care about it, and then what causes us to hit a dew point, both in process applications and in sampling, because it's really you know we make a big deal out of a lot of these things, but it ends up coming down to if we understand where our pressures and temperatures change. We can usually figure out why we're having a dew point issue in our process or in how we're getting a sample over to our analyzer. So the interesting point when I talk about this piece is although we're, we're doing this in a discussion about dew point analyzers, this part about what causes us to hit a dew point is really relevant to all of our analyzer sample systems. You know, it's one of the most common problems we hear in analyzer sample systems is, oh, I get liquids carry over in my gas analyzer. Well, why? Well, because you hit a dew point someplace. Well, why did I hit a dew point? And so we're going to talk about why that happens. And then we're going to talk about, you know, specifically the Z-gas dew point analyzers and some of the installations and applications. So first thing to talk a little bit about who Insight is. I go through this pretty quickly. Um, you know, Calgary, we're a Calgary-based systems integrator and distributor. We run a fairly large shop in Northeast Calgary. We got a full 10-ton crane in the building that we can lift a full analyzer building off the back of a flatbed, bring it in and do full systems integration. We're an AB3 compliant fabricator. Um, for Canadians, this is relevant. It's a, a Canadian registration number for pressure vessels and fittings and things like that. So quite thrilled because we had our, we, we have to do regular audits for that. And we had an audit this week that only had two observations, which no um, uh, recommendations for like required recommendations for improvement. It's basically a couple of things of, kind of hey, we noticed and you could probably, you could maybe add doing this if you wanted to. Um, so it was great. We're, we did very well in our audit. Um, We've got great documentation and drafting design resources. Um, we 3D model everything before we build it. We uh, do full, you know, when you're working with a big EPC firm, there's lots of doc requirements. We've got a lot of experience in doing that. Journey electrician and instrumentation people, full factory te acceptance tests here in Calgary. Um, we have full systems integration capabilities, anything from custom sample systems to full process analyzer integration, analyzer buildings, PLC and automation. We try to specialize in doing 
and really focus a lot on analyzer sample systems because we recognize that's often where systems have their issues. You know, there's an old adage that 80% of the problems in an analyzer installation are sample system related. We'll work on projects right from the front end engineering design piece to help specify what analyzers are going to go in and where sample points should be through the detailed engineering, fabrication, of course, we'll do field commissioning, and we have a big focus on service. We firmly believe that, you know, if we install a product, we should be the ones who are coming out there to help you service it, get it working, meet any site specific requirements. All right, so let's talk about dew points. So when we refer to the term dew point, we're talking about the temperature at which something that is in the gas phase will change to being a liquid. So, you know, our common experience of it is to wake up in the morning and see the dew on the grass. And so as, you know, as the, we might have a humid day and there's a lot of water vapor up in the air. And as it cools down in the evening, it'll eventually, if the temperature drops low enough for the amount of water vapor that's in the air, some of that water can no longer stay in the gas phase. The molecules slow down in their movements and they start to condense out. And they condense out as a liquid on the surface. And so we refer to this as dew. You know, we see it on the grass. Well, we think about it happening with ambient air and water vapor around us, but it happens with any chemical that can be in the vapor phase or in the liquid phase. Generally, the warmer it is, the more likely it's going to be in the gas phase. As it cools off, the more likely it's going to condense out as a liquid. What temperatures it condenses out depends a lot on the nature of the gas. So water you know, will condense at a different temperature for the same amount of water vapor, a different amount of, let's say, butane vapor will condense at a different temperature. It also is dependent on the pressure of the gas. And we see this in our instrument air compressors. You know, if you have an air compressor in your garage for your shop, when we take ambient air, that obviously nothing is condensing in, a, in the air right around me right now, but if I took that air and squeezed it into a smaller volume, I push the molecules closer together. They become more likely to touch each other and condense out as a liquid. So it depends on the pressure of the gas. And it also depends out on whether there's only a single component present or whether we have a multi-component gas. And so this is, of course, very relevant to natural gas. In the natural gas processing industry, both water dew point and hydrocarbon dew point are very important. So why are they important? What are drivers for dew points? You know, why do we want to measure this? Why do we would you like to know it? Well, from a operational, uh, from a facilities operations perspective, it's really important because it can lead to damage to our equipment. If we get water condensing out, it can be a place where corrosion occurs. Um, if we get water condensing out in our gas phase pumps, it can cause issues for pumps. If we get liquids condensing out in our pipelines, it coats on the pipeline walls and gives us more reason to have to pig out the lines. If we get liquids condensing out in our flow meters, it causes uncertainty in flow meter measurements. So there's a lot of operational issues associated with dew points. We're going to talk a little bit about gas hydrates or cloth rates, about the formation of gas hydrates and pipelines in that. And it blocks off flow and causes pressure buildup and can, again, cause us a lot of issues. Um, especially with, from a reduction of flow perspective, but also safety issues with hydrates. Probably in here it should be uh, corrosion as well. You know, if we get water condensing on, it allows acid gases to condense or to, uh, to absorb into the water and can lead to corrosion issues. Um, It's important to us because people are generally, we're seeing a lot of people, you know, with the shale revolution, 
and people producing a lot of shale gas. Certainly in Canada, the Montney shales are known to be very uh, hydrocarbon rich. And so we've got a lot richer hydrocarbon gases. And we have a lot more gas-based power generation going on. And hydrocarbon dew points especially uh, are big issues for turbines. So a lot of times on gas turbines, they like to have a hydrocarbon dew point measurement so they know whether I'm going to actually condense liquids inside my tur gas turbine. Um, then there's the tariff and custody transfer side of this. You know, if we look, I'm going to bring up a thing about some of the Canadian specifications for pipelines, but, you know, we have regulations in place all across the world, implemented differently in different countries, but usually regulations that are, are related to both the water dew point um, and the hydrocarbon dew point. And then finally, there's cost implications. If we are hitting a hydrocarbon dew point, you know, if we put a GC in to measure our BTU, and somewhere along the way, we've hit a hydrocarbon dew point and allowed some of the heavy molecules to drop out, then the, uh, the, uh, we've lost some of the potential BTU value. It's not made its way to the GC. The GC is reading perfectly for what's getting into it, but we dropped out some of the hydrocarbons before they got there. So now we get an invalid BTU reading, and this can cost us a lot of money. So there's a bunch of reasons why we want to be able to measure dew point and do it as best as possible. So when people talk about water dew points, it is the temperature at which water will first condense out. Um, it depends almost entirely on the water concentration and pressure. Um, because water, and when I'm talking about this specifically in a natural gas application, because water and hydrocarbons are immiscible, you're not gonna, you, you, the hydro, changes in the hydrocarbon composition aren't gonna really affect your water dew point. Um, so, but we wanna be able to know it really well because of the risks that it uh, causes related to corrosion issues and to the formation of gas hydrates. So I'm gonna show a picture of a gas hydrate in a pipeline in here. Hydrates or clathrates kind of look like snow, ice. And the as the water droplets form, they bring a whole bunch of methane in and it forms this complex structure. And you can start to build it up more and more in a pipeline until you'll see entire pipelines get blocked by this. So plants will talk about hydrating off. And especially when we look at plants that are putting in cryogenic units in order to... Uh, say produce more natural gas liquids, we've got to really concern ourselves, well, how good was the water dew point control before I started to try to condense out all my hydrocarbons where I'm going to form ice and clathrates in there? It's an important part of the quality specifications on natural gas. Every natural gas pipeline will have a specification on what allowed water content there can be. Hydrocarbon dew points, temperature at which the hydrocarbons first uh, drop out, depends heavily on the pressure, and it depends a lot on the composition, particularly the heavier parts of the composition. So things like methane and ethane don't condense very easily, but bigger molecules like hexanes and heptanes do. Um, people will sometimes think about well, can I just use my GC to measure the hexanes and the heptanes and then calculate a dew point? And it generally or never really works well because the GC has a certain detection limit and there's usually certain molecules it's not measuring as well. It might be the octanes, the nonanes, the decanes, the heavy big molecules that are there at very low concentrations but those are the ones that are gonna condense out the first. So we can't rely on this or even predict it from a lab GC analysis very well. We have to do a full, we're gonna to try to do it, people will do it in the labs for uh, test purposes, and we often need hydrocarbon analysis out to the C15s and C20s. Um, again, important quality specification in natural gas. 
And it's also very important from a fuel burning perspective. Um, Europe implemented a lot of this and implemented it in a certain way to try to make sure that they didn't have issues with high hydrocarbon dew points making it into furnaces because it can cause rich burns, flashbacks, flame outs, same in turbines. They get a slug of liquid show up in that turbine and can do tremendous damage to the turbine. So we want to concern ourselves about, you know, what's my hydrocarbon dew point? Is it suitable for the burner it's go I'm going into? So when we talk about things condensing out, and I kind of show it down here, you know, when we talk about especially hydrocarbon dew points, um, we'll often talk about things like phase diagrams. This is what I'm showing down here. It's a phase diagram for sort of different qualities of gas. Um, LNG, we vaporize, generally is going to have a very low dew point. On these phase diagrams, that right-hand part of the curve, I kind of always refer to it as a belly of the curve, the right-hand part of that curve is where the hydrocarbon dew point is going to hit. And it's quite different for, say, an LNG uh, versus a, a pipeline quality natural gas versus, say, a wellhead natural gas that's just had a, a, a TEG dryer out in the field. So different hydrocarbon gases, depending on how varied their composition is, are going to have different dew points. But it all comes down to phase, or phase diagrams often let us predict and understand why we're hitting dew points. So a phase diagram is a diagram that shows a relationship between pressure and temperature and what phase uh, the fluid is in. Is it gas? Is it liquid? Is it solid? If it's a pure species, the one that's shown up here, for example, is for water. If it's a single species, there's unique places where we transition from being a gas to a liquid. Everybody thinks, you know, when we think about it, if I said to you, when does water boil? Most of you'll say 100 degrees C. And we go, well, that's the temperature that at one atmosphere of pressure, if I have water, it will convert to being a gas. So I can look at a phase diagram and go, well, if my temperature is high and my pressure isn't too high, let's say I'm out here and I, I'm all on the gas phase side of this thing. If I start to cool this gas down, when it hits this line, it says that's the place where the first liquid droplet will show up. It's a dew point. When I get into this region over here, I'm liquid. From that region, if I heat it up, I can convert it to being a gas. If I cool it down, I can convert it into being a solid. So if I know my pressure and I know my temperature, I just draw a line across from that pressure, a line up from that temperature, and that would tell me, oh, at that pressure and temperature, water would like to be a liquid. So it enables us, phase diagrams will let us, enable us to know what's going to be the effect when I change my pressures and temperatures. They're more complicated when they become to hydrocarbon, when it comes to hydrocarbons and, and mixed hydrocarbons. When we have a mixture like, let's say, natural gas, we have some components that are very difficult to make liquefy, like methane, and we have some components that might drop out as a liquid very easily, let's say, hexane. So what we get is a region where on this side of the phase diagram, we're all gas. On this side, we're entirely liquid. And in this region, we're mixed phase. Oops. Okay. 
this is where all of our problems come up. This is where all the problems in our analyzer sample systems come up. These are the where the problems in our operating vessels come up. It's generally we most of our systems work well if the fluid is in a single phase that it's designed for. So a gas phase analyzer wants things to be a gas. A liquid phase analyzer wants things to be a liquid. My gas compressor wants to compress and push through gases. My liquids pump wants to push liquids through it. If I start to go two-phase, that's generally where I have problems. Two-phase causes me cavitation in my liquid pumps, damage to my gas compressors, liquids drop out of my analyzers, bubbles in my liquids analyzers. So we want to understand where the phase changes. What a hydrocarbon phase diagram tells us is, again, if we're out here, let's say, at a high pressure, and we cool the gas down. For some reason, my pen's not writing. Huh. My pen just gave up the ghost on me. Um, and see if my this thing is still working. Technical issue. Oh no! I hope my whole PowerPoint might have hung up. I'm sorry, I think my PowerPoint just hung up. It's usually happens to me after Windows has done an update. Let me see. Dale's are telling jokes while I try to fix them. <laughs> um, let me see if I can stop this presentation. I'm sorry. So, well, I can talk a little bit that slide because it's still up on the screen while I try to figure this out. Um, so what we, what we always want to do is we want to understand where we are on a temperature, on our temperatures and pressures are, and be able to look at that slide or that location on the phase diagram and say, well, what's going to happen as I go across my prep compressor? I'm going to need to increase my temperature. Or what's going to happen when I go through this kill, uh, my pressure? I, or if I go through a cooler, I'm going to lower the, the temperature. Um, I'm just going to try stopping screen sharing. Does that work? Go back to PowerPoints. No. I'm just going to relaunch this presentation and see if it works. And re screen share, and we should be back at it. I'm hoping. Let's try it out. All right. Screen sharing is back up. See if my pen works again now. There we go, back to life. Okay, um, sorry about that. So if uh, when we have a phase diagram, we can look at it to see what'll happen if we said, well, at one point in my sample system or my process, I'm at this temperature and I reduce my temperature down um, and move over to here, I can see that once I move into here, I'm in this two phase region. So I'll know that I've hit a dew point and I've started to condense out liquids. So the thing with um, the thing to understand is that liquids are going to form uh, in our process operations. They can suddenly form uh, when we change temperatures or pressures um, in our process lines and during the process of sampling a gas. 
liquids may be present or created in the pipeline itself. And so again, we're going to have to consider things of uh, using appropriate probes to try to minimize the introduction of perhaps some entrained liquids. And so, you know, a lot of people will see um, some of these mem membrane separation probes, most notably people know, you know, think of the A plus probes where there's a membrane separator there at the probe and it can be used to keep the, any entrained liquid droplets that are in the pipeline to prevent them from getting over into our analyzers or our sample systems. Liquids can be created in the system. Um, often, you know, the one we often think about the occurring is by compression. You know, this is where we see what we see in our natural air and air compressors. We take air or take ambient air, compress it, and all of a sudden liquids drop out. Same thing happens at compressors in our gas plants. They can happen by, liquids can be created by reducing the pressure. We're going to go back and look at the phase diagram and see why that is. They happen commonly with temperature reduction when we get temperature drops. And then we also have to concern ourselves about things like the Joule Thompson effect, combined, combined effects of pressure and temperature reduction. In the JT effect, we basically get cooling because of protection, uh, pressure reduction. It's referred to as adiabatic cooling. So, in our facilities, we have to think about, well, when do I compress gas? I might have low pressure wellhead gas. So my well, low pressure gas, casing gas, might not have any liquid droplets in it. But if I try to compress that to push it into my gas plant, at the outlet of my compressor, I may have uh, in liquid droplets appear, same as I have in my air compressors. So anytime compression is applied to a gas that's below the belly of the dew point curve. So if I have a gas down here and it's at low pressure, but at some reasonable temperature, right? As soon as I increase the pressure on it, I can push it up into that region where I hit, get inside the two phase zone. And now I have condensation happening. So if that's in my sample system after a pump, I can have liquids after the pump. It's a common problem in SEM systems. Um, but also can be problems when we have pumps for recompression into pipelines, process pumps, acid gas reinjection pumps, et cetera. The interesting part is that depending on the shape of the, of the dew point curve, we might be at some temperature and pressure to start out again, where we're well above the belly of that uh, phase diagram. And what can happen is as we lower the pressure, we actually go right into the tube phase zone and we get condensation. So now we get hydrocarbon liquids drop out. This is the one that's worrisome, especially for things like I said, those GCs that are measuring BTU. The GC runs at low pressure, pipeline gas is at high pressure. So whenever we go across the pressure regulator, as we drop the pressure, we have a risk of hitting a dew point. But it happens in our operating facilities as well. We can start out in a pipeline at high pressure and we get pressure drop as we run along. The Sorry, my phone's not off. Uh, we can get pressure drop as we run along, uh, along a long length of pipe or tubing. And so we can get pressure drop during transportation of the sample, or it can be pressure reduction in the pipeline system to say at city gates. And we can have a cyst of uh, uh, a, a natural gas coming in that's above its dew point uh, or not at its dew point. But when we lower the pressure down, it suddenly hits a dew point. Again, this is a really common thing during sample preparation when we're making, getting samples ready for our analyzers. So when we wanna go across a regulator, and we're gonna talk about adiabatic cooling as well, but across any device that drops pressure, needle valves, even across filters, we can suddenly hit a dew point. So of course, dec de decreasing uh, temperatures. So from an operations facility, any place the gas cools down, we have warm wellhead gas coming up. 
hits a cold surface, boom, starts to condense out. Um, anytime we have it in our sample systems that we have, heated sample line come into a cooled uh, analyzer enclosure, um, we can hit a dew point. By the way, if there's any questions along the way or anything you want me to explain again, please just jump in. Either you can ask it either in the chat or just turn on your mic and interrupt me. Um, ambient temperature changes. So we see this a lot when we're trying to do natural gas dew point analyzers. We'll see people that don't insulate the pipe nozzle and heat it or don't insulate and heat the probe. Um, if we've uh, if we've got a hot a warm or a, a cold ambient air, you know, from Canada, minus forty five outside. Well, everything's got to stay above the dew point. If that sample nozzle process pipe gets colder than ambient or than the dew point, we start to get condensation. It's the same when people are pulling your gas grab samples. If you go out to pull a gas grab sample, it's winter time. Your grab sample cylinder is in the box of your truck. It's cold. You go to pull a sample of gas off the pipeline. Soon as the gas is exposed to that cold surface and some rushes in, liquids condense on the wall. So now when you fill the cylinder up, if you let it sit there for a while and then take it to the lab, you've condensed extra liquids in there and you'll show a richer value for that natural gas BTU content than if you'd pulled that same sample into a warm cylinder. So we've got to be aware of every time there's a temperature change in our sample system or our processing units, that's where dew points can possibly occur. So when we look at, <clears throat> say, an analyzer sample system, we want to look for every place where the pressure changes, because like we said, changing pressure can co uh, cause a dew point, and every place where the temperature changes. And then we have the combined effect, the most referred to as the Jewel Thompson effect. And you know, we use this, uh, you'll hear people in the natural gas processing industry talk about JT expanders. And we use this fact that when natural gas or methane expands, it drops its temperature. It loses about four degrees C for every 100 PSI it drops by. Half a degree C for every atmosphere, 100, 100 kPa. Um, so when we drop the pressure, if we're going across, say, a single stage regulator or across a needle valve, we can start out where we're, we're up here. Oh, pen's not working again. Try this again. We can sort out where we're at high pressure. As we lower the pressure, not only does the pressure drop, but because of this Joule-Thompson effect, because the gas has to pull heat in as it tries to expand, we get cooling of the gas as well. So it may not seem that significant, but when we're looking at something like a natural gas pipeline that might be running up there at say, you know, 600 pounds, call it 40 bar. Um, if we drop that pressure from, say, 40 bar down to 2 bar, 38 bar, we lose around half a degree C for every bar, we're going to drop by almost 20 degrees C. This is enough to cool us that we hit dew points and condense out parts of our sample. Very common for us in gas sample systems. So we want to look at things like, have we used heated regulators? Or did we drop the pressure in multiple stages to let the gas warm up between pressure drops? All of these can be prep, prep, uh, beneficial to try to prevent us from hitting a dew point. So in Canada, their specifications are sometimes phrased differently in different parts of the pipeline. But what you can look at across there, um, we also, uh, this is a TC energy specs. So part of it is in the US. 
So one of the things we first things we see, if you look to the right, you see in the US, the spec is seven pounds per million cubic feet for water. And in the Canadian pipelines, it's typically four pounds or 65 milligrams. So why the difference? Well, it's warmer in the US. So they actually put a different specification in because they wanted to have a specification built around, I'm not likely to hit a dew point. So in Canada, because it's uh, it's generally colder, we've got, actually got a lower water, water dew point uh, specification. Um, so we can convert milligrams per mi uh, meter cubed, pounds per million cubic feet. Waters in North America is often specified in pipeline ap applications in terms of a concentration. That's only because they only used to have analyzers that could measure concentration. There wasn't a good online way meant to do dew point. And really the concern is not concentration. The concern is what's my dew point? And that's why you'll see in some of the newer parts of the TC pipeline, they express it as 65 milligrams per meter cubed, which is a water content or a concentration measurement, or a maximum dew point of 10 degrees C at any pressure greater than 8,200 kPa. And so they do this because they go, they know what the real concern is, what temperature am I going to hit a dew point? So when the water starts to condense, that I get a problem. So if I know my dew point, and I know my dew point is less than, say, minus 10, I know I'm okay. Hydrocarbon is always specified on dew point because it's impossible to do just on composition. So you can't do it on concentration. Hydrocarbon dew points are very sensitive to the heavy hydrocarbon content, and those might be there at very low concentrations. You know, you might think it doesn't really matter. I've only got two ppm of my C10 hydrocarbons. How much difference can that make? We're dealing with an issue in pipelines right now with a chemical called dithiazine that can block off regulators at compressor stations and is there in the PPB level because it goes through a phase change across the regulator. And so, you know, even though these chemicals are at very low concentrations, if you only have a couple PPM of, say, a C10 hydrocarbon, but you're hitting that hydrocarbon dew point because of the sheer volume that goes through a pipeline, it causes problems over time. So, you know, if we see our regulators are freezing off like that, that's the effect of the Joule-Thompson effect. We have to understand where our pressures and our temperatures change, and then understand where what we're gonna do to try to keep that from causing a dew point. This is critical in our analyzer systems. So if I was trying to measure water dew point or hydrocarbon dew point in this system, when I look at that regulator and I see that it's got a block of ice forming on it, well, ice is really good at a really good insulator and it stays at about zero degrees C. So I would have a very difficult or impossible time measuring a dew point higher than zero degrees C in this system because the regulator there is going to be a cold spot that condenses out fluids and makes it so no gas with a dew point higher than zero degrees C can get past there. So I want to understand where do I have any possible cold spots in my systems because all my biases and phase changes happen at pressure and temperature changes. Common places we see things that like are, again, pipe nozzles that aren't insulated or heated, sample lines that have cold spots in them. People will go, yeah, I ran a heated sample line, but you left the last six inches bare, sitting outside or in my analyzer shelter even. Regulators, needle valves, anything that drops pressure, you can get that Joel Thompson cooling across it. Exposed tubing and fitting, you know, people will say, again, I heated my sample line, but my pipe nozzle and where the tip of my probe comes out isn't heated. So now that's my cold spot. So we want to understand cold spots are going to really affect our dew point measurements. 
Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about analyzers and how we measure those dew points. And we're specifically going to talk about the ZGAS Instruments Devices. So ZGAS uh, is a company out of uh, Maryland, and they make a very unique dew point analyzer that measures at line pressure. It does simultaneous water and hydrocarbon dew point analysis. So both of the dew points we talked about can be measured in the one box. It's in, generally immune to contamination. I mean, if you puke over a whole bunch of liquid amine from your amine plants or something, uh, it's going to be problematic and have to be cleaned. But from general, it doesn't get contaminated by other things that are in the gas phase typically. It uses a patented technology referred to as SEERS. We're going to talk about what that is in a minute that allows it to do this water and hydrocarbon dew point and with very good accuracy, about one degree F, half a degree C. Um, so you guys have a patent on the Sears technology. Um, it was selected as one of the natural gas technology finalists by hydrocarbon processing. It's a highly accurate first principles measurement of dew point. See if this pen's gonna work. There we go. So one of the things I should mention in here, I probably so this is basically a chilled mirror. You a lot of you, if you're in the natural gas industry, are familiar with the Chandler manual dew point devices. It's a chilled mirror device. Some people call it the Bureau of Mines tester because it was the original method. The Bureau of Mines said this is how you determine dew point. You cool an optical surface down. As it gets colder, liquids drop out on the surface. You have some optical way of watching that surface, seeing what temperature the liquid's formed at, and that's the dew point. So this is what we mean by a first principle. This is literally, first principle kind of means you're doing the method that is exact, that is actually determining exactly the thing you're trying to detect. So for example, on a GC, it's not first principle. I'm measuring the thermal conductivity of the gas and I'm correlating that and, and the retention time of the gas on a column. And from that, I'm building a mathematical model that correlates that to a certain chemical. First principle method means I wanna know what temperature something's gonna condense at, so I get, some, I get an object colder and colder, and I watch for when something condenses. I measured exactly the thing that I want. So Sears is a first principle measurement. It cools a surface and determines when things condense on there. It uses spectroscopy to tell the difference between what chemical it is. Is it a water that condensed on there, or is it a hydrocarbon that condensed there? The way it does this is it puts a crystal in there. Imagine I've got a, a piece of glass. They use a very unique patented material for the crystal, but imagine I've got a piece of glass and I get my piece of glass cold. Matter of fact, imagine it's me. I'm down in Houston, Texas. And it's nice, got a great air conditioner in my hotel. And I walk outside into that 100% 35 degrees C Houston air. 100% relative unity, and when I walk outside, my glasses fog up right away because my glasses are cold and there's a lot of water vapor there. So they use a clear crystal to bounce a beam of light through it. It's kind of what we're showing through here. This is the crystal side. Bounces a beam of light off the surface and <clears throat> looks to see if there's any liquids on that surface. So, Sears now stands for Chilled Evanescent Infrared Spectroscopy. And the evanescent is the interesting part here. When a beam of light says, well, I mean, okay, again, I was like to, to make analogies back to things that we're used to. We think of a piece of glass as being clear, light goes through it. But when I look at the piece of glass, I can often see my reflection in it. Why is that? because some of the beams of light can't go right through. They realize that there is a change in refractive index that on one side of the surface, there's air, 
that has a low refractive index and the glass has a higher refractive index. And so when the beam of light hits that, it goes, I actually am gonna bounce off the surface. But the only way it can know if there's something of low refractive index on the other side is it actually has to start to go through. So what happens is the beam of light comes up, reaches the surface, it starts to go through, starts to go through the surface and realizes, oh, I actually can't go, there's a change in refractive index. There's gotta be a chance for me to reflect off of there. And so that bit of light that goes through, touches the material on the other side and then comes back into the crystal. That part that went through, we call the evanescent wave. The evanescence just means it's went to the other side. And so when we have a crystal like this, we can shoot a beam of light in, have it be bouncing off the surfaces. And every time it goes through, it interacts with what's on the other side of the crystal. So one of the unique things in Sears compared to all of the other chilled mirror technology, all of the other chilled mirror technology, if this is my mirror or my chilled surface, they look at it from the gas side and see how much light bounces off. That means all of the, all of the thing that's sending the light and the receiving the light are on the gas side where all my contaminants are. In the Sears technology, the thing that's sending the light is inside the crystal and receiving the light is inside the crystal side. It doesn't ever interact with the fluid on the other side. It allows everything to stay nice and clean on that light launching side and light uh, detection side. So the important thing is the light does not pass through the gas. They use two different wavelength sets of light. One which is very sensitive to the hydrocarbon molecules and one which is sensitive to the OH molecules in, in water, atoms in uh, water. So how does it work? Artist conception. We have this infrared light source. We have two different beams of infrared light. I'm showing them as kind of red and purple here. They go through the crystal. So beam of light comes up to the crystal, does that little evanescent wave thing, touches the fluid on the other side, goes back in. Mirror on this so we can do that a couple of times, get more bounces, more sensitivity. Um, and we're flowing our natural gas or whatever through here. So we start out and the light levels are quite high. This is how much light. The two different wavelength groups or bands, or I'll call them colors for now. The two different colors are bouncing off the surface and the surface is clean, there's nothing there. So lots of the light makes its way through and gets to the detector. The dotted line here represents the temperature. I start to cool the temperature down. The light levels stay high. There's nothing there to, for it to interact with. I cool it down to the point. I don't know if you saw my little animation there, but I show this little brown layer show up here. Hydrocarbon just started to touch the surface. Liquid hydrocarbons. When that happens, the hydrocarbon sensitive wavelength drops in light intensity. So now I know I was at whatever that is, minus five degrees C, and suddenly the hydrocarbon light intensity dropped. I hit the hydrocarbon dew point. I keep cooling the crystal down. So once I've hit the hydrocarbon dew point, I can keep cooling it. The light level there doesn't change anymore. There's already a layer of hydrocarbon liquids on there. But I keep cooling the crystal down, and suddenly I hit the water dew point, and the signal on the water wavelength group drops away. So now I can go, oh, well, I had a hydrocarbon dew point of minus five and a water dew point of minus 19. So by using the two different wavelength bands, 
So you guys is able to determine is it a water dew point or is it a hydrocarbon dew point and determine both dew points on a single device. Then I let the whole thing warm up again. All the stuff, I've still got natural gas flowing through there. So as I let the crystal warm back up again, just due to the ambient temperatures and flows and heat flux in from the ambient around it, as the crystal warmed back up, the water and the hydrocarbons that laid down as a small layer on the crystal surface evaporate back off into the flowing gas. And now I'm ready to do the whole thing over again. I've cleaned the crystals up. My light level's all back up to high. And now I can cool it down again and look for the next, look for a dew point again. So the crystal cools, the light continuously is measurement, measured. The evanescent wave interrogates the surface. Condensation occurs. The evanescent wave properties change. Hydrocarbons absorb differently than water does. And we can detect that dew point. The penetration is really tiny, so we only need a smallest of layers to start showing up. This is measuring the actual dew point, the same as a bureau is a mine tester. It's just automated all of that and automated the process. If you've ever run a Chandler, you know, it takes some training to figure out is that a water dew point? Is that a hydrocarbon dew point? Because uh, we have to look for different ways they condense on the surface. This is automated, all of that. Typical applications will be natural gas processing, doing simultaneous and water, di water uh, hydrocarbon dew point, water and hydrocarbon dew points. We used in uh, infer process applications for optimization of dehydes, cryo units. When we're putting things into cavern, especially coming back out of cavern, it can pick up a lot of water while it's in cavern. So we have to re dehydrate it. Natural gas pipelines, tariff enforcement, water, and hydrocarbon dew points. Gas turbines and boilers, hydrocarbon dew point is a big thing. It affects low NOx burners and combustion control, it affects burner safety. We can cause flame out, back damage, back propagation of flames. Uh, can be a big issue. Chemical plants. Again, often a lot of our catalysts are very water sensitive. So we want to know what does this, does the product we're buying and bringing into our, say, our ammonia plant, our, our hydrogen generation facility, because hydrogen is such a big deal now, um, does it meet specification? Am I okay for water and hydrocarbon two points in? The Z-Gas, I just have a bunch of pictures up here, is available as a portable device. You can see a little suitcase version sitting up here. So you can go out and do uh, testing at multiple different facilities. You know, in the U.S., because the ambient conditions are good, it often can just get mounted outside. So there's the explosion-proof version mounted outside. In Canada, of course, because of our climactic conditions, we will usually put it inside of some kind of a heated enclosure. and uh, control the ambient temperature around it so everything stays in specification. And again, we got to keep all the lines hot. So if we're doing something like that, we'll have a heated sample bundle bringing our samples in. Uh, again, specifications um, can cool about 50 degrees C below, lower than the ambient. Actually, this is not true. We can actually go about maximum about 70 degrees C below ambient and get dew points down to as low as about minus 40. Dew point uh, accuracy of half a degree C. CRNs for Canada up to 2,000 pounds. Uh, we have RS45, Ethernet, analog and digital IOs, all the usual things you'd expect for process installation. So in summary, um, from the analyzer side of things, the Z-Gas has really unique abilities especially to be able to measure hydrocarbon and water dew point uh, uh, simultaneously. Also provides extremely, if you only need to do water or only need to do hydrocarbon, it's available in those configurations as well. Should have mentioned that there's basically a water dew point, the WDP, the hydrocarbon dew point, the HDP, and the duo doing both of them. Um, it's a first principle measurements. It's a true dew point using a patented technology called SEERS, high accuracy, CRN, CSA, everything we need for a full Canadian installation. Um, uh, 
arguably, you know, it's, yeah, I mean, it's the most accurate chilled mirror type device um, in that it's got a very, such a sophisticated method of detecting when the dew point occurs and what dew point it is. Um, so that's going to wrap me up on the analyzer. I should have probably put a summary side about our about the uh, the gas processing side too. You know, one of the things we want to make sure is we're aware of. Know where your pressure changes and your temperature changes happen. I cannot stress it enough. All, so many of the problems in our analyzer sample systems are, I tried to measure a gas that was below its dew point because I let it get too cold, or I let my pressures get too high someplace and had condensation. So just know where all your pressures and temperatures uh, change and be rigorous about it. We've had installations in the field where it's taken us a lot of time to figure out that, oh, when somebody installed it, they didn't wrap the heat trace around the pipe nozzle. So there's a, there's a cold spot at the pipe nozzle. So um, important to consider. From Insight's perspective, you know, uh, we spoke a lot today about Z-Gas. Um, we carry a number of different product lines uh, for all measurement type devices, from, you know, mass spectrometers to near-infrared devices, total sulfur analyzers, um, trace oxygen analyzers or dissolved oxygen analyzers. We've got a wide product line uh, and we'd love to talk to you uh, if you have any application needs. Put my contact info up there. Um, you'll all get a copy of the slides and a link to this presentation on YouTube uh, after, after probably in the next day or so. That wraps me up. Thank you, Phil. Great job. Awesome. Thanks, Greg. Good seeing you again, man. Always nice to hear from you, sir. We'll get right. together before Christmas. Well, let's do. Say, so, Phil, quick question. Um, is it a continuous flow through your yes. device there? Yeah, continuous flow, but um, intermittent measurement. Kind of the, the cool and heat cycle is a little bit varied in time in that the farther... If the ambient temperature is high and the dew point temperature is low, it takes longer to cool the crystal down until you hit the dew point. Yep. And then once it hits the dew point, you gotta let it warm back up again. The analyzer watches to see if you're up to uh, full light levels again. And then, uh, and then uh, redoes the analysis. Now, I guess just a uh, follow up to that. <clears throat> Should you physically align it such that the, the, the cooling surface is kind of like self-cleaning, if you want to call it that? It doesn't matter because uh, the stuff that's cooling is going to, it should evaporate off again. Right. If, if it's something like compressor oil. Um, I, sorry, I went in the chat here too. I'm just going to quickly address that. Um, there's a question in the chat about uh, comparing to say the, the Michelle and the Amatec dew point analyzers. Um, always hard to ask a distributor to answer a question like that because you want to try not to sound too biased. Um, it's the only one that does both water and hydrocarbon by chilled mirror. The Michelle will do hydrocarbon by chilled mirror and water usually with a uh, 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 aluminum oxide type sensor. Um, so it's the only one that does them both by chilled mirror. It's the only one that does it using a crystal surface versus a metal surface. So the Amatec and the Michelle both use metal surfaces. And of course, metal surfaces can be subject to potential corrosion. So for example, the Amatec uses an aluminum surface that's anodized black, and it can get bleached by H2S. So they don't like to use it in high H2S streams. We don't have that same issue because the crystal is tremendously inert compared to most metals. The Michelle uses um, stainless steel. Um, but again, you know, it's, it comes down to how, how robust is the surface? I think the, um, the Zegas specifications also show a, a wider potential cooling range. I think that 70 degrees C is the largest 
cooling range in the automated till mirror industry. Hopefully, hopefully that answers your question. Certainly, if you like, I've got a whole you know written comparison of the different uh, dew point analyzers. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Janet. Um, yeah, going back to what you're saying, Dale. So yeah, I mean, if you end up, you know, the issue, and this is why it's always important to put a good sample system for this up. If you get compressor oils or something like that onto it, well, they won't evaporate away very easily. So it's really important that somebody puts a good enough coalescing filter system in front to try to make sure that that's kept warm. So the coalescer is not going to condense out anything that the dew point analyzer should see, but it will condense out and train droplets of things like amine or... Um, yeah, the, the high surface tension stuff. Yep, yep, yep. Gotcha. Yep. No, right on. No, appreciate yep. it. Hey, Harvey, Harvey Cortell, good to see you. Um, sour stream, no, they don't negatively affect the wetted surfaces inside the device. Um, you know, the main flow cell block is, is stainless, and then the actual active element is the crystal, um, and they're uh, both, you know, highly H2S resistant. So we've used it in various sour streams. Um, yeah, Dave, yeah, exactly that. Yeah, so in the worst case, we're about, who Sorab's on, he's going to be able to correct me if I'm wrong here. We're about five or six minutes between cycle in the worst case. And we like, and you know, we, the, that's kind of the cycle range that we like to work in anyways, because we like to give enough time on the warm up cycle that there's enough time for everything to evaporate away. Thanks, Kevin. Um, so yeah, but it can range, um, you know, I think we can get the cycle time down as low as three or four minutes and high up, you know, if we look, if we're one where we're worried about, we're getting some heavies that take longer to, uh, content to come off, maybe up to 10 minutes, so. But it tracks and holds the output. You're basically always seeing the last valid reading. <laughs> 